There are many ways to build a quantum computer, and one fascinating technique is to take individual atoms and place them exactly where we want them. This atomic scale engineering is not only an amazing technological feat, but it is also making great progress towards building a universal quantum computer. But how can scientists control individual atoms? And why does that make a quantum computer? Let's discuss it. Quantum computers promise to unlock a new paradigm of knowledge. There are certain problems that are just not solvable. The only known way to find an answer would be to have a supercomputer work on it for hundreds to thousands of years. Not so practical. But some of these problems can be solved in a fraction of that time in a quantum computer. A universal quantum computer would help us in so many fields, from advanced drug discovery to answering questions about the nature of black holes. But they are difficult to realize because the quantum world is a messy one. Information is always being lost as the environment pollutes our pristine quantum system, leaching that valuable quantum information and feeding it back into the entropy of the universe. But we know we can locally overcome the universe's entropic desire and construct useful quantum systems. The question is, how do we do this on a large enough scale to make a universal quantum computer? And this all comes down to, what is the best qubit? Quantum computers are built from qubits, individual quantum objects that we can control. There are many different types of qubits, such as superconducting loops, trapped ions, quantum dots, topological qubits, photons, mechanical drums, and many more. The most popular one at the moment is a superconducting loop. These qubits are formed when you take a loop of a superconducting material and make what is called a weak link in it. There are a few different ways that you can make this, but to keep it simple, you can just picture a small gap in the loop. And it is this small gap that allows the loop to behave as a quantum object. But why is this so popular? There are two main reasons. They are relatively easy to make and we can engineer interactions between them with electrical leads. This means that they are great for early quantum computers, which is why so many companies use them. But they are hard to get to a universal quantum computer because the number of wires for controls and interactions becomes untenable as we try to connect thousands of qubits. We need something that can be more compact and needs fewer controls. The key to this is finding a way to introduce interactions in a clever way. But what do I mean by interactions and how can we design them? To generate quantum entanglement, you need to interact qubits together. You need to bring the qubits close enough that they begin to influence each other. Superconducting qubits are connected with wires. So while they are spatially separated, their mutual influence on each other is carried through the electrical current. But you can also make qubits from atoms and atoms produce electrical and magnetic fields. So to get two atomic qubits to interact, you need to place them close enough so that their fields overlap and influence each other. To do that, we need to place atoms exactly where we want them. And that is exactly what scientists are doing. In order to build a quantum computer from atoms, you need to place those atoms on another substrate. On the surface, these substrates will just be a periodic array of atoms, just like this one. Because I'm a physicist, we'll just assume that this is an infinite plane of atoms. To construct these qubits from single atoms, they took a substrate that had randomly distributed titanium atoms all throughout the substrate. Now, these titanium atoms are not very useful. While they are qubits, we're not controlling the interaction between them. What the scientists did was take in a scanning tunneling microscope, or an STM for short. And what this does is it is able to pick up individual atoms. They come into contact with an atom, they have the tip charged so that the tip will pick up the atom. They can then pick it up and move it to wherever they want. Doing this multiple times allows the scientists to construct the titanium 
qubits in the exact order and position that they want. We have three titanium atoms. Each one of these is a qubit and they now have enforced interactions from the distance between each one. The problem is that these are all identical qubits. We can't interact or control each one individually because they all are identical. The way the scientists do interact with them is that they bring the STM tip in and they can use fields coming from this STM to drive these qubits. And this is a way that you can control them. But again, they're identical. So we can't control them individually. That means we have to engineer some way to change each of the atoms. The way the scientists did this was to place iron atoms nearby some of the titanium atoms at different distances. Iron is magnetic, so it produces a magnetic field. This magnetic field interacts with the nearby titanium atom, causing it to change its energy level. And because this now has a different energy level, it's no longer identical to the other titanium atoms. Now what they have is three qubits from the three titanium atoms, and each one has a different energy level because of the proximity to the iron atoms. Now this is exactly what we want for a quantum computer. We want engineered interactions from their distances, differences in the energy states from nearby fields, and some control mechanism that can control all three. The cool thing about this work was that because these interactions are so strong, because the atoms are so close, they are able to perform quantum calculations extremely quickly. As opposed to superconducting qubits that have some delay when you turn the current on and off. Now, obviously this is not scalable. An STM is in a cryostat. It's a complicated piece of machinery. Position placing all of these atoms one by one is time consuming and clearly won't be easy to scale to thousands of qubits. But this is preliminary work. As scientists develop better techniques, we may be able to find ways to position the qubits and control them in a much more convenient way. This may not be the future of quantum computing. Maybe superconducting qubits are just fundamentally better but these researchers are asking the right questions to find out whether this is a valid technique for the future. This atomic scale engineering is hard to do. It is manual and requires experts to even place a few atoms. But if done correctly, it can be scalable to much larger levels. This recent research has demonstrated that they can perform quantum calculations extremely quickly with such a system. But there is a large gap between demonstrations with a few atoms and a universal quantum computer. However, there are still smaller goals that are worth pursuing, particularly in the realm of analog quantum computing. But to find out more about this, you'll have to watch this video.